If you are shooting a bit of video, you're making decisions about cinematography. You're choosing the exposure and frame rate, how you frame the shot and whether to move the camera. The filmmaker's decisions about camera work are shaped by a single concern. How will this creative choice affect the viewer? Cinematography literally means writing in movement. The filmmaker can select the range of tonalities, manipulate the speed of motion and transform perspective with their camera. There are a few factors at play to create well-established imagery. Range in tonalities. The images, range of tones and shades in cinematography can be explained in contrast and exposure. With the contrast showing whether pure blacks, pure whites and large range in between either grays, a higher contrast image displays bright white highlights, stark black areas and narrow range of shades in between. A low contrast image displays many intermediate grays or color shades with no true white or black areas. High contrast images can seem dark and dramatic, while low contrast ones suggest more muted emotional states. You can see the different degrees of contrast more clearly if we drain the color out of the original shot. The standard rate for film based shooting was 24 frames per second. Today's 35mm cameras offer the filmmaker a choice of anything between 8 and 64 frames per second. Typically standardized at around 24, 25 and 30 frames per second. More frames per second shot results in slow motion. Often a change of speed helps to create special effects. Perspective. The lens of a photographic camera does roughly what your eye does. Each type of lens will render perspective in different ways. A wide angle lens could exaggerate the depth you see. A telephoto lens could drastically reduce the depth. The focal length is the distance from the center of the lens to the point where light rays converge to a point of focus on the film. There are three general sorts of lenses. The short focal length, the wide angle lens, it's usually 35 millimeters or less and has a relatively wide field of view. The middle focal length, medium lens and it's common 50 millimeters and this lens seeks to avoid noticeable perspective distortion. The long focal length telephoto lenses are typically 100 millimeters or greater in length. They flatten the space among the camera axis making the plane seem squashed together. They also magnify action at a distance. Special effects can be categorized in four ways. Superior position, which is the most unrealistic sort, creates multiple perspectives within the frame by laying images over one another. Rear projection or process work was widely used. It's simply projection of a footage of a setting onto a screen, then film actors in front of it. Mat work is a portion of the setting photographed on a strip of film, usually with a part of the frame empty. The footage was combined with footage of action, filmed to fit the blank area. Framing is carefully considered by filmmakers of all sorts. It is one of the most powerful cinematographic techniques. It was crucial for the first major filmmaker in history, Louis Lumière. Even at an early stage of cinema, Lumière was able to use framing to transform everyday reality into a cinematic event. For example, the arrival of a train at La Ciotat station. Lumière stationed the camera at an oblique angle, which gives a dynamic composition with the train arriving on a diagonal, which lets us see people's expressions and watch the way they walk. Frame dimensions and shape. Painters and still photographers can display images at any shapes. Filmmakers are limited to rectangles, which brings us to aspect ratios, which is the ratio of frame width to frame height. For example, an image that is twice as wide as it is high is said to be in a 2 to 1 ratio. Early film inventors set the proportions at approximately 4 by 3, yielding an aspect ratio of 133-1. In the silent era, some filmmakers chose to experiment with ratios. Experiments with widescreen formats began quite early. Abel Gantz shot and projected sequences of Napoleon in what he called triptychs. In contrast, the Soviet director Sergei Eisenstein argued for a square frame, which would make compositions along horizontal, vertical and diagonal directions equally feasible. Aspect ratios have developed through time. Most common examples are 185-1, 185-2, 185-3, 185-4, 185-5, 185-6, 185-7, 185-8, 185-9, 185-10, 185-11, 185-12, 185-13, 185-14, 185-15, 185-16, 185-17, 185-18, 185
166 1, 175 1, 235 1, and 221. The simplest way to create a widescreen image is by masking it at some stage in production or exhibition, which is called hard matte. Another way to create a widescreen image is by using an anamorphic process. Here a special lens squeezes the image horizontally, either during filming or in printing. Using widescreen framing. A common solution today is to fill a wide frame with a face. For more distant shots, the director is likely to put the information that's important, off-center, so that the viewer can concentrate on that. For example, Yilan by Surema Sise. Another example is Chun Hyung, where the director multiplied points of interest within the frame with the support of staging the scene and timing the actor's performance. Masks and multiple images. The rectangular frame hasn't prevented some filmmakers from embedding other image shapes in it. This has usually been done by attaching masks over either the cameras or the printer's lens to block the passage of light. It was quite common in the silent cinema and also has been revived in sound cinema by directors like Orson Welles. Then you have multiple frame or split screen imagery, often to, re to present scenes of telephone conversations or to build suspense. We gain a godlike omniscience as we watch different story actions at exactly the same moment, like the opening of the Thomas Crown Affair that shows men converging to commit a robbery. On screen and off screen. Our eyes have a very wide field of view, somewhat over 180 degrees, but a camera lens shows a much smaller slice of the world. This is no disadvantage, as the frame shapes our experience, calling attention to what the filmmaker wants us to see and what to imagine, and we as viewers help the filmmaker with this task, because we know that what's in the frame is part of a continuous world. We're most aware of off-screen space when it creates suspense or surprise and any genre can employ incursions from off-screen. For example, in a party scene in Jezebel, the heroine is the main focus of attention until a man's hand comes abruptly into the frame. Filmmakers are well aware that we need only a few hints to start imagining things taking place outside the frame. Camera Position when Louis Lumière decided to frame the train from an oblique angle, he made decisions about camera position, which includes angle, consisting of straight-on angle, a high angle or the low angle, level, either parallel to the horizon or a canted frame, height, and finally distance, which can be an extreme long shot, which is mostly used for landscapes, a long shot where figures are more prominent but the background still dominates, a medium long shot where the human figure is framed from about the knees up, a medium shot where the human body is framed from the waist up, a medium close-up shot that frames the body from the chest up, a close-up shot which is traditionally showing just the head, hands, feet, or a small object, and finally an extreme close-up which singles out a portion of the face or isolates and magnifies an object. While making a film, Camera placement is one of the most important decisions a director has to make. As the saying goes, there's only one right spot for the camera in each shot. In the 2010 film, The Social Network, David Fincher carefully frames the characters depending on the durational weight of the scene. Camera placement plays a key role in visual storytelling. Framing can stress a narratively important detail. It can specify where characters are, how they respond to each other, and it can also put us in their position. Framing can serve the narrative in a number of ways. In a film, repetition and framing during certain situations can create patterns that the audience can associate with. Framing can also add a visual interest of its own by playing with camera distance for intricacy and scope. By including a range of information, the viewer is encouraged to search for details or discover abstract patterns. Our eyes also enjoy seeing objects from an unusual and striking angle. This creates an impression and makes the object livelier. Moreover, framing can also create a comical effect that depends on the careful combination of mise-en-scene and camera position. Cinema isn't the only visual medium that utilizes framing, but what's unique about film is that the frame can move with respect to what it shows us. This ability is referred to as camera movement. There are different kinds, such as the pan. On screen, it scans the space horizontally from the left or right. The tilt, 
it yields the impression of unrolling a space from top to bottom or vice versa. The dolly shot is when the camera as a whole changes position and travels in any direction along the ground. The crane shot is when the camera moves above ground level and either rises or descends with different variations. And sometimes the camera movement is simulated. This is usually seen in animation where movement is mimicked. For many decades, camera movements in live action production depended on putting the camera on a dolly and are often mounted on rails. Body mounted camera units are common as well. This allows the camera operator to steer the camera while walking. This type of device can go places that would be difficult for a dolly. Sometimes the filmmaker prefers a bumpy image compared to a smooth one. This sort of shot is created by a handheld camera. Instead of attaching the camera to some sort of support, the operator simply walks with the camera braced on its shoulder. A zoom lens provides a continuous range of focal lengths. When the camera operator zooms while filming, the result is a mobile framing despite the camera staying in one spot. Some viewers can't distinguish the difference between a zoom or tracking shot, but filmmakers do. The zoom lens reduces or blows up some portion of the image, but with a genuine camera movement, we see different sides of objects and backgrounds gain volume and depth. When the camera moves, we sense our own movement through the space, while in a zoom, a bit of the space gets steadily magnified or demagnified. Camera movements have held an appeal for filmmakers and audiences since the beginning of cinema. For one thing, frame mobility can create a flow of new information for the viewer. It can also give on-screen elements greater volume and solidity. What's more, we tend to see camera movement as a substitute for our movement. We aren't completely fooled, of course. We never forget we're watching in a film theater. But nevertheless, camera movement provides several convincing cues for movement through space. Camera movement creates an interplay of on-screen and off-screen space. As usual, one choice leads to others. For instance, just as filmmakers must decide how to motivate a story actions, or whether to motivate lighting sources, they must consider whether to motivate camera movement. Filmmakers are especially fond of solo camera movements at the beginning of a scene or the entire film. A tracking shot can establish a low-call and then smoothly let the characters enter the space. Whether dependent on figure movement or independent of it, the mobile frame can profoundly affect how we perceive the space of the action. Mobile framing involves time as well as space, and filmmakers have realized that our sense of duration and rhythm is affected by the mobile frame. Since the camera movement consumes time on screen, it can create an arc of expectation and fulfillment. The velocity of frameability is important too. A zoom or a camera movement may be relatively slow or fast. The speed of the mobile framing functions rhythmically as in musical films. By choosing the duration and speed of camera movements, the filmmaker can pace our understanding of the plot's action. While shaping time and space, mobile framings can become motives across a film. An example would be in Hitchcock's Psycho, which begins and ends with a forward movement of the frame. Overall, as with lighting, color, and other techniques, cinematographic choices can develop in the course of the movie. Welcome to the chapter of mobile framing and film form. Mobile framing is a kind of framing that produces changes of the camera height, distance, angle, or level within the shot. In James Renoir Grand Illusion, the camera movement has been given several functions, all directory, supportive of the narrative. Camera movements are independent of the character's actions, which make the film more unusual. In one scene, a prisoner is digging in an escape tunnel and tucks a string, signaling that he needs to be pulled out. An independent camera movement builds suspense by showing that, that the other characters have missed the signal and do not realize that he is suffocating. Here, camera movement creates a somewhat unrestricted narration. Another example is when the men in the prison learn that their friends have recaptured the city. 
Renar presents the shot as celebration of spiritual unity, with the camera moving among the men as they begin defiantly to sing the Matthias. This complex camera movement circulates freely among the prisoners, suggesting their patriarchal courage and unified defiance of their captors. In Michael Snow's experimental film, Wavelength, gives the mobile frame a different role. Instead of helping us construct the story, the camera style blocks that effort. Instead, Snow asks us to concentrate our attention on how the frame of mobility creates patterns in its own right. The film begins with a long shot framing of a loft apartment, facing one wall and the window. The camera zooms in abruptly a short distance and then holds that framing. And then zooms in a bit more and then holds that. And so this goes on to the 45 minute length of the film. By the end of the film, a photograph of the ocean waves is shown on a distant wall. The film is structured around a single kind of frame mobility, the zoom in. The film progression concentrates on how the different lens lengths transform the space of the loft. Gaunt illusion and wavelength illustrate in different ways how frame mobility can shape our perception of a film space and time. Renard motivated his cell of frame mobility by narrative form, while Snow made his technique in principal form concerning motivating other aspects of the film. Welcome to the chapter of the long take. When people talk about filming something in real life, they often imply that the shot is recording actual duration. Usually it is, but you can compress the story within a single shot. Here's an example from the film The Only Son. It is well past midnight, and we have just seen a family awake and talking. The shot shows a dim corner of the family's apartment, but eventually the light changes. By the end of the shot, morning has come. A long take is not the same as a long shot which refers to the apparent distance between the camera and object. A take is one run of the camera that records a single shot. When an entire scene is rendered in only one shot, the long take is sometimes called a sequence shot. In any film, most filmmakers mix edited scenes with scenes handled in long takes. This allows the filmmaker to bring out specific values in particular scenes, or to associate certain aspects of the narrative or non-narrative form with the different stylistic options. In a long take movie, editing can have a great force. After a 7 or 8 minute shot, a cut can be quite strong. The long take can present, in a single chunk of time, a complex pattern of events moving towards a goal. And this ability shows that the shot duration can be as important to the image as photographic qualities and framing are.